ready. And hello, and welcome to Agile World. <laughs> hello, and we seem to have interrupted uh, someone reading. Uh, who's that? Is that Scott? Scott, what are you doing with that book? Oh, um, well, it's uh, the pirate organization. Have you ever heard of pirates? Uh, well, we, we seem to recall recently spending about a month with one. Actually, it's more like six months, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I was hoping that you were going to be able to give us a guide on how to be an actual pirate today. Oh, I, I don't know anything about pirates. Um, do you have a do you have a letter of mark, or do, are you uh, you you free range? Honestly, I, I I think you've got the wrong person to talk about pirates. I uh, know. Uh, I, I I think I think perhaps we found exactly the right person. So anyway, though. The, we, I wanted to talk about this article that you've written, the eight-part article, which actually I read because eight parts was not my normal enemy of all mankind. Cool. <laughs> so, um, okay, pirates. Go, go on then. The pirate, if I must be. <laughs> the pirate, if I must be. Well, we, need to, we need to know more about this pirate <clears throat> pirateism. I'm going to call it pirateism. All right. Look, one day, I'm going along, mind my own business, and the guy who writes all the no estimate stuff, Vasco Duarte said would you like to come and do a podcast and did a podcast and we're talking about deming and we're talking about manufacturing and we're talking about lots and lots of things around about software development and teams and everything else and he asked me one question what's the best way for a team to get around the system barriers so the systemic barriers the culture around about the team that's stopping them doing everything and i had no answer and in, th and in three nanoseconds i turned around and went they should be pirates now <laughs> That's really interesting for a few reasons because they should because, be ran randomly. You just came out and said they should be pirates. pirates. And then, I, and then I spent the next ten minutes justifying why. Um, and the most interesting thing after that was, um, if you actually listen to the podcast, they're quite funny because I'm Scottish. So it's the only so I've so noticed. Vasco Vasco interviews lots and lots of people around the world, and mine's the only one that beeps every seven seconds. <laughs> So you're suggesting that Scottish people beep when they talk? All the time. Beep. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what, so what was fascinating was I, I looked at the podcast notes about this because and um, and someone had written, "Oh, why didn't you mention Steve Jobs?" And I went, "Why would I mention Steve Jobs?" <laughs> and then I found out about Steve Jobs' piratey thing, and that was really exciting. Uh... Okay. Mm. So how okay. did you carry on the conversation afterwards? When obviously there must have been a bit of a shock when you said just be a pirate. Yeah, well, you see, there's a guy called Lord Cochrane, and Lord Cochrane was a admiral in the British Navy, and he's the most famous famous admiral nobody's ever heard of. Right? Um, people who sailed with him went off and uh, wrote books. If you ever ever hear like. Um, Oh, midshipman Marriott or something. Um, that was that was actually written by someone who had actually been with them, and then Patrick O'Brien researched him and did all the Master Commander stuff. So you know all of the, um, yeah, Master Commander, far side of the world, <laughs> a man, a boat, to be contracted as a voiceover person, a man, a boat, and a doctor plucking his violin. <laughs> so, so I've been to Blackbeard's Castle, which is now mainly a tourist thing. Um. On, on one of the Caribbean islands, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, there are no doubloons lying around anywhere. I think they've been spent long ago. But you know, I, I love the idea of being a pirate. I'm just trying to work out how that fits in with modern uh, enterprise uh, organisations because they tend to have this weird thing called governance that uh, comes alongside and sinks your ship. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so think about governance is like the East India Company. They've got yeah. all the agreements, they've got all the trade routes, and you can't get into their ports without them. Okay, now there's a first of all a couple of things. This is why Steve Jobs loved them. So when Steve Jobs set the company up, he actually had a pirate flag, um, uh, you know, and um, in the you know where they all worked. He and what he said, and I think this this is the most this is the most interesting thing. He said you know um, you want to be a kind of like a pirate because you don't want to be in the navy because the navy. Um, tells you what to do, mm. the Navy makes you go places. So if you're a sailor on a boat, right, the Navy tells you where to go. The Navy tells you where to attack. 
And this goes back to Cochrane. So Cochrane um, tried to court Marshal Amber, uh, uh, Admiral Gambier because he trapped three quarters of the French Navy in the Basque Roads, which is just outside uh, Bordeaux. And the tide went out and they were all stuck in the mud. And uh, Cochrane said, I want to go in there and shoot them up. And Ad Admiral Gambier said, no, you know, you can't. No, you, we can't risk the ship. And he's going, yeah, there's a quarter of the French Navy <laughs> trapped. Um, and the, the, the communications went backwards and for, forward. And then eventually Cochrane just took off, went in there, sank about 20 ships, and became a national hero, got back and um, demanded that Admiral, Admiral Gambier be um, court-martialed. Yeah. Now, all, all Gambier was doing was what well, anyone who's in a large governance situation, they're looking at the risk. They're thinking, well, all those, sh all those ships are bogged down. I don't know these road, these... Uh, these uh, kind of waterways that well, so it looks like a risk. So let's not do any risk. Uh, yeah, but Cochrane knew the waterways, and he was quite confident. And he went and he did it, and he and he got it. And and that again is the the thing that you know Jobs was trying to channel. Yeah, I'm not going to be IBM. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm going to be I'm going to make Apple. And in fact, the, uh, the 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 pirate flag that Jobs had had a, an Apple in the eye patch. <laughs> <laughs> you know the old multicolored rainbow one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's that idea of um, actually having the ability to do something without the you know without reference to the external stuff, without worrying about the external stuff, um, and also um, disregarding stuff. So it's 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 actually choosing choosing what to disregard. Now you might think that that's that's probably dangerous, uh, but how many tales have we got of? Um, of things just taking so long, not getting there. Um, and it's because of all the processes and everything they have to jump through. But it also very, it links very well to allowing teams, trusting in your teams and trusting in your people to be able to so, do what they actually do. So in transformations, I call it adjusted governance. So uh, if you're going to do a transformation, if you don't get adjusted governance, you may as well give up to start with because you're not going to get very far because governance itself stops you from doing the transformation that's what it's designed to do it's designed to stop things from going and, and doing processes that aren't already there and it's there to monitor things to make sure that they work the way they've always done yeah. so if you don't get adjusted governance you can't do a transformation there's also failure bias so i used to work for uh, the world's largest uh, expenses management company okay and you go to you go to put the system in and everyone's expenses management company right was completely different and it was completely complicated and it was completely over engineered and what's happened is every let's say i've got um, 100,000 employees okay anytime anyone did something that broke a rule i put the rule in okay now after a couple of years that system's incredibly complicated now because 80 yeah you know, 100,000 people can break a lot of rules did they actually lose much money? Probably not. Uh, were the were the breaches, you know, substantial? Probably not. But you end up with this huge tax on a hundred thousand people, yeah, because one person here, one person there, one person there, uh, you know, broke some stuff. Now, what I'd like to think about is if you go back to manufacturing, I started, oh, I started in 19, 19, 1986 with statistical process control. And the first thing you learn is statistical process control is you have a system that's a process. And if it's got quality problems, you do lots of inspection. Yeah. And if it hasn't got any quality problems, you then you, you do less and less inspection until you're almost not inspecting it. So the idea is build quality in and, you know, and, and don't test it. Deming famously said, you know, it's, you know, it's easier to change the heat in the toaster than it is to kind of scrape the toast. And all the time we're kind of scraping the burnt toast. So all these policies, all this governance, it's all toast scraping. Mm -hmm. Isn't so, that a risk, though, if you're putting in... Sometimes governance and things like that can be a little bit too heavy, and it is restrictive. Yeah. So, so that's what I think you're coming at it with, Scott. But I, I think, actually, done right, governance is a liberty. But for most organisations, governance is, is chains and a cage. Well, but, yeah, I mean, you... They, they almost put too much in as a as to them to make them feel safe and secure, but not realizing the restriction that they're actually mm -hmm. creating with these heavy governance. 
which is actually restricting their people and restricting the development and the process, meaning that the quality goes down. That's my piece. (laughs) <laughs> I had a mentor uh, that I met in Edinburgh and he said, Carl, how do I get to Edinburgh Castle? And I started to explain how I'd get him to Edinburgh Castle from where we were standing. And then he said, and he, as, as I was still doing it, he turned to the next person and said, how do I get to Edinburgh Castle? And they started to, and he turned back to me, Carl, do I get to Edinburgh Castle? And I'm going, well, yeah. Um, so what's the difference between the two of you apart from the roads and things? The other criteria. Well, I didn't set any other criteria. I just want to get to Edinburgh Castle. And I think that's the problem we have with governance is that people want to fill in the gaps and control, totally control stuff. And actually businesses want to be successful. They kind of don't really, you know, they have regulatory compliance and the law. But apart from that, they don't really care how how you get there. Um, they, what they do want to do is, if possible, replicate good and not do bad. But actually, if you ask the board of directors of most organizations, they really don't care whether or not you send a P55 form or, th- or not. It's not relevant to them. What they care about is, did we, did we succeed? Did we meet the market requirement? Did we help our customers? That's their level of interest. And, and uh, a lot of people are, they love um, control. And that's what governance has become for most people. It's, it's control. And that, that goes back to the East India Company. And that's why they were trying to shut down the pirates because the pirates, it's not so much just that they took stuff, is that they created a secondary market that they couldn't control and couldn't tax. Yeah, most of which was the American colonies. So yeah. most, of the, most of the foundation of the American colonies and, and probably even the, the revolution was all funded by the... You know, they could have the pirates of the golden age. Um, yeah. Because the, the stuff they got, they just, you know, they sailed up to New York and sold. Yeah. So here's a question. What m- made you decide or how did it come across you becoming chief pirate for Agile 20 Reflect? How did the name, how did it, how did you make that decision? We know how passionate you are about pirates. It's, it's got good understanding on where it comes from and your feelings on it. But how did it actually come across? Because I know a lot of people are probably thinking, who's, who's this chief pirate well where's the pirate come from okay so it's an invention it's a mythology okay um so there's a, there's, a, there's 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 three more strands to get into this one is the be more pirate movement and they're really about changing the world for a better place um there's a ton of stuff out there um that's just done wrong okay so things like the universal credit system that needs pirated up Right, there's people stuck there without any money in their houses, yeah. and nobody gives a damn. Okay, um, <clears throat> the government is not going to save you. Yeah, the government is not going to come and save you. I'm going to challenge that because I spent a long time designing the Scottish version of it, and the impetus is different. So the guiding light for the governance is different. So the English governance is focused around not paying people, and the Scottish governance is focused around paying people to make sure that they're in a position to be able to help themselves. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, And I I think that that's, that's... yeah. um, And, and, but let's look at some other things. So we know that when government and big business get together, and if you read anything like um, freedom from command and control by John Seddon, amazing book, um, or, um, oh, the Westminster book you wrote, where it just it details everything in consulting from the 1980s about the government and consulting that's led to point where nothing ever gets done. And that results in track and trace, right? So track and trace is the government going out to, I don't know, eating, eating pals, right? Um, and they can't do anything. Why? I got a vaccine yesterday. Why did the vaccines work? Because it went to the NHS, okay, which is which is basically a fleet of small healthcare organizations that are locally organized. So, so again, you know, being local, being distributed, being smaller. So was I, I got a contact from someone saying, you know, we're, we're building a new team to do attack track and trace. And then I got a message back saying, Oh, don't worry. We, they've decided to hire someone internally. My response was, but they already did that and it didn't work because although it was farmed out, the actual organizational construct that ran it was internal to the government. <laughs> it wasn't internal to the NHS. And the problem the externals had was they weren't given access to the NHS databases for good reason. Um, and, and, but the actual command and control was government, not NHS. 
and but they said that they decided to give it to a government department to sort out. And I'm going, well, if it's the same department that tried to solve it last time, you may as well not bother. <laughs> I think. Uh, I'm sorry. Is there again? Yeah. I think uh, you're you're freezing up, Scott. So I'm just no, saying no, that. I know. I'm going to turn some things off. Okay. <laughs> I've only got 19 million things running on the Mac. Uh, the PowerPoint's open. That that takes half a Mac. It does. Do you know is that do you know what? that's not just me then? Because I obviously live off PowerPoint for my job, and it, that's it. My fans go crazy. It just does not like PowerPoint. You got Why? fans. You got fans in the background. Go, yeah, Sabrina, <laughs> <Yay>! Sabrina. Did <laughs> a presentation, girl. <laughs> yeah, no, not those type of fans. Unfortunately, it's just me in my little room with my two okay. dogs. Well, I've um, just quit. I've, I've just quit WhatsApp, Slack. Teams, Did you? discourse, um, messenger. It, it's mainly um, it's mainly PowerPoint. Microsoft applications that uh, souk up um, processing. No, and I've got no idea why Word's open because I haven't used it today. It probably just opened itself and has, has been watching you for a while. because <laughs> <laughs> it's jealous of some Microsoft. It's the word I. <laughs> <laughs> So the, so the other thing about the Be More Pirate uh, movement is they are helping people to overcome problems. So they do it. Uh, that's what I learned to do. Uh, mutiny mentoring. I love the term. Mutiny mentoring. They get some people together and say, what disruptive thing would you like to do? Right. Well, if you thought about doing this and that and this, and these people could probably help. And suddenly you put a solution together. And, um, and whether it's, uh, you know, climate change stuff, whether it's, uh, you know, access to services stuff, you know, there's tons of stuff that you know people can get involved in, and 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 people like you and uh, and me, and uh, when I say you, I meant uh, both of you. Um, yep. We've got the ability to. We come um, as a pair now. Eh? <laughs> we come as a pair now. <laughs> Scary, huh? <laughs> and it's so funny as well because it's because we were quite resistant to you putting us together as well. You were well. See, I, I made that. <laughs> I, I, I understand what you're saying though and I do feel that and I don't know whether this is more now because of the situation with us being at home people are very risk averse where oh, yeah. I want to see more people taking more risk because risk isn't necessarily a bad thing it's not a negative thing okay. because you can find out yes okay you'll make a mistake but that, what you'll find from that mistake will flourish into some massive benefits. But I feel as human beings, with everything that's been going on in the world, and my fear is when we do come back out into the world, we are all going to become extremely risk averse. We're not going to want to take risks. Um, leadership are going to basically put so much rules and governance around us because they don't want us to do risk. Do you know what I mean when I'm saying that? And I've actually got a bit of a fear of that and not being able to try something or be able to do something different or just go, do you know what? Let's see what happens here. Then I think, sorry. sorry, Scott. No, you go. So I, I, I put that in my talk I did in the festivals is that we, you know, launching out into the shallows is, is part it. of what we do. It's, it's, it is a launch and we, we kind of know what we're playing with but we don't know the results but we don't go so far to break anything that's important that will destroy everything else and i think that's the bit is is um understanding risk you know we know that everything is risky um and governance and policies are there to manage certain kinds of risk but actually amongst people trying to find better ways to work you can do small levels of risk really quickly and find out what works and what doesn't work um, and I think that's the opportunity here. And, that, uh, you know, I am genuinely horrified with, you know, big consultancies going into major enterprise and going, yeah, we'll sort out your agile transformation. It will take us two years to understand your business. And I'm going, what? You know, it's you don't need to understand the business to do agile transformation. You need to look for the low-hanging fruit that you can do small iterative tests with and, and find out what works and what the, and even even when you've got a template for something that works, it won't replicate because it it's based around people. 
and processes and activities, not not something that you can replicate because actually the people are all different. Uh, the the things you're trying to do are, are different. Um, and so there, there is no templating in agile transformation. What there is, is learning. And if you don't change the process of doing a transformation, you haven't done one. Trust <laughs> The one thing I bang on about constantly, you always hear me, is about trust, trusting people, trusting people to know where the limits are, trusting people to be able to have, you know, do the abilities and shine the way they should be shining, you know, trusting that everyone's going to do it. I'm a massive thing about trust and employers should trust their employees. If they slip up or they fall off the edge, that's fine. It's okay because we can pick it up, clean it up and put everything back together. But we're all sensible human beings. We all so, know where the limit is. So, Scott, did you have a sense that you had a pirate crew as part of the festival? No, I went and got one. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd been shanghai <laughs> <laughs> I met you when you you appeared at one of the meet on the one no a couple of our meetups, and obviously we have a we have a mutual friend. Uh, in common, but um, when our mutual friend talked about you, I didn't click you were the same person until in the meetup. And I was naturally drawn to you by the things that you were saying at our meetup group and everything. I didn't actually connect the dots till later on because I can be dipsy. <laughs> so You but, can be dipsy and it's I, important. Oh, if you want to be dipsy, you'd be dipsy. I'm very dipsy. People like me for it. But yeah, you were kind of just building your own pirate ship and crew really. Deliberately. Um, so almost everyone came in on little trails. Yeah. Experiments. Um, some lasted longer than others. <laughs> <laughs> We're still on an experiment, aren't we, Scott? We're still being experimented on. Excuse me, I can see some cheese in the corner of the room. I'm just going over there. <laughs> I, I, I once worked for this company and they were really into, they, they were really said they were into uh, good to great. So I went there to the company and I said, uh, you know, and um, it's all about the good to great book, uh, Michael Collins book. And uh, they've got a great saying there. It's not about, it's not about, um, you know, the skills you've got. Yeah. It's about getting people that, um, that you know, that are quite brilliant. And the phrase they use is, um, you know, it's, it's who's on the bus and who's not on the bus. Yep. And the thing about the trustees was, you know, they all got, you know, they were all people that were happy being on the bus and taking any role like yourselves, you know, and doing, I'll try this, I'll try that. Good God, you turned up one day and found you were head of marketing. So Brina. <laughs> she yeah. came to the meeting and we said, it's good to know that we've got a new head of marketing. And we just all agreed and she just had to. Uh... <laughs> we were joking about that, but that was actually what happened. I literally like, oh, where's, where's, where's such and such? It's like, oh no, you run the show now. Oh. Okay, let's give this a go. What's the worst that can happen? Bad but that, but that's your, yeah, but that's the attitude you need from a good crew, right? And I was I always felt that anything coming up, like everyone would work out who was who was the best person to kind of look after it, and it would depend on like urgency and things. Um, and uh, you know, Ash. I mean, again, mm. you know, Ash contacted said, uh, "Like, I, I like what you're doing. Do you need any help?" And the next thing you know, he's in, and then he offers to resign five times until I do. <laughs> He offered me his resignation a few times, but I, I counted it with "I'll go if you want." Because <laughs> the, 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 the interesting about it between him and me is, is um, he's really the CTO. I'm I'm just the political negotiator. Um, because no, you, we just haven't thought of a name for you yet, and we're still thinking of it. Well, there's loads of names for me out there in business, but you're not allowed to put them out on air. Apparently, <laughs> too rude. <laughs> but it's 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 that negotiation because I think there's. You know, uh, it's very easy to jump to solution mode when we don't really understand. Again, it's that thing about launching out into the deep. I don't really want to launch out into the deep. I want to see what we're trying to do and why and how it impacts everything else rather than just doing stuff. And we did just do quite a lot of things, uh, but we didn't do them across the whole of the tech. <laughs> it's, 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 I'll tell you what I did that was, uh, that, that, and actually nobody knows this, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, don't, don't feel that cause and effect right nobody knows this i deliberately only made videos and i didn't write about the project so i could deliberately lure dyslexics in <laughs> <laughs> are happened? we taking over the world <laughs> <laughs> i think it worked <laughs> there is 
so there's actually how many there are about what five there's about five four five there's, i think about half the trustees are dyslexic to some level yeah oh, shows how awesome we are that's our superpower <laughs> that, that was the best thing of the festival for me was uh um one of the one of the women who were on one of the calls and came to a lot said that the dyslexia beating was amazing for her because i mean she's she's um yeah getting to the towards the end of her career right so she's um and i'd never seen her dyspraxia as a super weapon imagine if you yeah. spent uh, all that years working you've never seen your, dis your dyspraxia as a super weapon and you walk and you come to our session you walk out and suddenly you think about your entire life differently yeah that's fabulous I was talking to, obviously, when we had our little breakouts and that lot, and I was explaining to everyone that as soon as I kind of was, I actually verbally said about it, and I was comfortable and confident to go, hey, I'm dyslexic. It makes you feel a lot better, and it's not as much of a burden. And all those things that you're trying to hide, and you're spending a long time writing a documentation, trying to get it perfect, because you're panicking because of your dyslexia, kind of that panic kind of goes away and you feel a lot better. And I was discussing that and they, they agreed with me, but it was nice to speak to other people who were in the same situation as I was and actually being able to say, well, hopefully this may help you, but you're probably, there was things I actually learned on that call as well. And I think we need to do another one because it was popular. Put it on the board. Yeah. Did, does the board technically, does it still, there we go. Does it still exist or not? I mean. No, the board for Sunday. So, oh. you know, with the meeting we're doing on Sunday to yeah. sort of look back and look forward. You know, what 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 could we do next? And that's, yeah, that's getting populated. So um, it's, getting, it's getting quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. So so here's, a, here's, a, all right, here's, what, here's what I'm going to end on, right? In my dyslexic talk, the two, there's two areas of people that are got high percentage of dyslexics. One is entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and one is criminals. Oh. Pirates! <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang a minute, I'm going to draw a rich picture. <laughs> it's a Venn diagram. <laughs> so we got we got uh, criminals, entrepreneurs, pirates, and agileists in the centre. <laughs> oh, agile coaching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, could, you could create a whole brand new framework with just that all you need is two circles and you can oh so, so true story i went to one of the muti mutiny mentoring sessions okay there's a true uh, actually true story and it was online on zoom and we all went to a room and we were doing that bit where we're kind of finding out about each other a little bit and the first speaker said look i really liked the be more pirate book um but i read it on audiobook because i'm i'm dyslexic and then in a largest conversation, second person said his bit and then said, and by the way, I've got the audiobook as well because I'm dyslexic. Third person immediately said, I'm dyslexic. So that's three of us dyslexic out of five. And then the guy next to me said, not so fast. And he went, that's four <laughs> out of five. And I went, guess what, guys? <laughs> five out of five people on a completely random call at Be More Pirate were dyslexic. But that's wow. because we're very visual. Well, we're great at videos. And you know, you've just you've just hinted this over to me. I've always said that I struggle reading books. I struggle reading books because it, if I, I have to pick it up and read as much as possible, because when I pick it up again, I have to go back two or three pages to try and remind myself what I read. And then I panic. And then nine times out, I keep repeating the book. Now, I never thought of getting the audio version. So I've just picked something up. Maybe I need to start getting audio versions and maybe that's the reason why I struggle. Like Carl, your book that you, you gifted me, I will probably read about six or seven times because I'll so forget. <laughs> I, I do actually have the software to turn it into an audio book. So I, I am going to do that and I'm going to read it myself because I understand what the important parts are. You know, I understand what where the waffle is and where the, where the detail is, um, but it's, I just haven't had time for some reason, Scott. Um, so. <laughs> It, it, but I do. It, I, I got several people said to me, "Carl, can you turn that into an audio book?" And I'll, I'll easily read it. I'm going. Well, that that makes sense. Uh, and um, I did that book without any um, anyone pre-reading it before I published it. <laughs> I just relied <laughs> upon on uh, spell check. 
because uh, everyone was too busy. And I just thought, well, I don't mind being seen to be an idiot. I do mind actually being one. And I think I'd be an idiot to myself not to release the book. Can I ask a question? Can sure. Yusuf be the voiceover? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Antoine, you, you, I, I'm Yusuf, attendant. He's got his own he's got his own things he should be writing, Yusuf does. So he's got right, that gonna, voice. All right. So so for the Agile World listeners, viewers, right, I really recommend this book. Pirates so, in the Navy by Tandy Vicky. Vicky. Yeah, he's a really nice chap. He did the future of uh, work. So Alex Osterwalder, you know, the guy that wrote the business uh the business model generation. Yeah, he really recommends it. Um, it's all, it leads off with entrepreneurs try to do stuff in tech. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I mean, again, everything we did with the pirate thing really comes from this thinking. So let's disrupt, let's try stuff. Let's not, let's not put massive infrastructure in. Yeah. Let's not put a cost solution in, you know, let's, yeah. let's just be free. The, the other thing is, um, and, and this is, this is important, right? I assume everything I do is wrong, right? And I assume it's always an experiment. Yeah. And uh, and I, I kind of say this and people look at me as if say, yeah, you're just saying that. It's like, no. We've probably had about seven or eight pivots, mm. you know? Yeah. But if you yeah. kind of think you're always going to be wrong, you don't mind pivoting. Yeah. You're not holding on. You're not trying to save your idea. You're actually trying to save the 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 what you're delivering rather than your piece of it. Yeah, and, and yeah. being open to other people's ideas on on how to pivot that's the other bit that most people you know i i meet a lot of people involved in business who are so desperate to be the voice that created something and actually i'd, I'd rather just you know who's got the best who's got the next best idea let's you know that and that's what i where i work with teams i empower them to look beyond my job title and say well what do we do next? Because actually I may be responsible, but I uh, give you the liberty to tell me I'm wrong and to tell us where we should go instead. And that's what I did when I was working in the same place as you, Scott, with the team that I had, because, you know, no one person has all the right ideas. It's impossible. Um, And I also gave credit as well. Always give credit to the person that, that takes that step of faith because it's really important that they feel valued yeah which which again is um you know if you look at pirate ships yeah they all support each other they all had shit you know all the equal shares they all yeah. uh, i mean the captain only got yeah the captain only had two shares right everyone had a share he'd captain had two shares it wasn't like the captain had 90 percent of the profits mm. and the and the crew had the 20 percent. yeah i just had an amazing idea there's obviously at some point we all because we've never physically met each other right there's no, actually a go. pirate ship in middlesbrough that you can go and have a bite to eat in <laughs> and I, I, they actually take you yeah, up and down but you said, but you said I, middlesbrough i know i know well I, like you know it's i'm not saying can we I rate think. it um i mean <laughs> no, they do, like, i know there are okay there's one in london as well there are these pirate ships that you can hire out where they will do the full theme and you could dress up we need to do that only, only for it to swarm it and take over. So the first meeting of the Be More Pirate movie uh, mo- uh, movement was on the um, the the Golden Hind, the replica. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I before I'd even I think met them, I'd uh, I'd been asked down to interview Tui, you know, the the holiday people, and yeah. uh, so they got me into the boardroom and they were outlining all this problems they got because. You know, you know, when you get to what we do, the interviews are more like, could you help us with our problems? <laughs> not, <laughs> not could we check your CV? And and I remember I was sitting there and it was on the third floor and it looked straight into the Golden Hind. And I'm like here talking about apps and development and TUI and holidays. And I'm like, <laughs> there's a pirate ship. <laughs> and, and they're like, yeah, yeah, but... Yeah, yeah, but we've got this kind of real issue, and I'm like, "How long's that been there?" <laughs> <laughs> a while. <laughs> and I completely switched off, and I couldn't wait to get. I couldn't get wait to get out of the building, so I could go into Borough Market and around the back and see it. <sighs> I've 
I've had worse times. I remember I did um I did an interview once in uh Manchester where they film, they do all the filming and preparing for like Hollyoaks and everything like that. And I remember I walked into a building for an interview and it was at the back of where Jeremy Kyle is filmed. Obviously, he's, he's wow. there's so lots of teeth on the floor. Well, do, you know, do you know what's <laughs> funny? I didn't realise this. All of a sudden, I was stood outside at the time I was a smoker. I was stood outside having a cigarette. And all of a sudden, I heard the shout and the screaming. Then this camera c- crew ran outside. And then all these people started shouting. And then Jeremy Kyle comes outside. And it's obviously the bit where they run off the show and they've done a runner. And they're filming. And here's me sat there going... Oh no, oh no, I'm not going to be in the background of a Jeremy Kyle. So, oh no, oh no. And that was like by far the most, it was in the media center. That was it. By far the weirdest place I've ever done an interview and nearly been in the back. I, for months, I was fast forwarding Jeremy Kyle shows to double Just to make sure you weren't in there. Just sat there going, I one point, <laughs> I think I put my coat over my face like that, going, no way. There's no way I'm being seen. I know because those. I know because you were on next week. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Are you checking out your escape routes? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you just go through there and you do a. Run- they have a van outside. The door, so I'm surprised the person didn't run into the van. Anyway, I didn't get that job because I was too busy looking out the window to see if there was any more still going on. It just reminded me when you said that. Sometimes, sometimes it's hard to interview when there's parent ships or Jeremy Kyle happening. Even though when you're panicking your head, is I might I'm gonna have to explain to my mother I'm on the Jeremy Carl show, but for not for anything that I've done, which is normally part of the show. What was your worst interview? <laughs> oh. I've had I've had strange That's an interesting <laughs> question. <sighs> So I, it's not the worst interview, but I wasn't, and I can't, I'm not going to say the company, but if this person hears it, they're going to laugh. I went in and sat down with the CTO and had a really, really good interview. But halfway through, he said, look, can I just stop you there for a moment? I've just got to jump on a conference call. And I'm thinking, okay, then is he going to leave the room 15 minutes and come back? Then he starts dialing into the phone in the middle of the room and he goes, you don't mind if I just do it? So he goes, we can carry on talking. I just need to say my name and make noise every once in a while so they know I'm there. And I said, okay. I said, are you sure you're comfortable? I said, I'm happy to give you a break and I'll go get, ask for a coffee or something. Are you happy? Because I could be hearing confidential information. He goes, no, 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 it's fine. Uh, we'll carry on talking. So I sit there while, and actually he ended up having to do a lot more speaking. And then afterwards he goes, right, I want you to meet my two scrum masters. They're going to interview you now for an hour. And what they actually did was they decided to get some free consultation off of me. And they went, well, we don't know if you're going to get hired, but how would you fix this? And we've got this <laughs> and how free stuff. This? Yeah. And how would you, and they're telling me all this stuff, right? And they're going, well, so if we, if we were to do this or we were having this problem and I turned around and went, do you know what? Four hours later. And I turned around and said, do you know what? You know, anything else you got? I said, cause you're just getting this completely free now. And then they went, Oh, hang a minute. Let's go get a coffee. And it carried on and on and on and on and on. And I ended up getting the job which meant it really easy because when I came to the office and you don't need to tell me anything, you've already told me what your issues are. I'll just get straight to work. Cause they literally were trying to pull as much freebies as possible. And they ended up hiring me. So I don't know if you can class that as strange, but it's different. <laughs> what was your worst one, Carl? Um, so I went hijacking the process now. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I, I got interviewed for this really senior executive job in a in a very well known media agency and consultancy in in um, Bankside, and they were global. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went in for the interview, and I got on really well with the people. So I, I, said, I got I got a phone call saying they'd like you to come back for a second interview, and I'm going okay. So I went back for a second interview, then I got called back for a third interview, then I got called back for a fourth interview. Then I got called back for a fifth interview, at which point I think I'd seen most of the people in the building. Um, I, I think that I was beginning, because I don't know what was going on, but uh, the, the it was the sixth interview, interview that was the worst one because I could tell, I told them to shove their job <laughs> because I just didn't go. I mean, after you know, if you don't know you should hire someone after two interviews, you're incompetent. And, you know, I, it was a really good job. 
and it was it's a very well known agency that's done really well uh and i was coming onto the board onto the the, the main team and i could have helped them but i just thought you know after that amount why am i bothering you just don't know what you want so that the interview that never had involved me telling them where they could shove their job <laughs> i had okay. one, i had one where I had multiple interviews, but obviously I was going to work for a company who, who I was then going to go work for a client. And before I was even offered the job or even negotiated anything, they'd already forward my details onto the client that I would apparently be working with. And they'd already booked me into meetings to tell me all about the project. And I hadn't even been told by the company I was going to that I'd actually got the job, let alone negotiated or signed any contracts. And I was already being sent meeting invites for the client I'll be going terrible. to. And so it terrible. Was like, what about you, Scott? Um, I, in a company that doesn't exist anymore, I think it's a housing scheme now in Dunfermline, when I was in my 20s, I went along to the interview. And um, there was the interviewer and a woman. And the woman had had the job before. And the interviewer got called away for five minutes. And uh, the, woman that was, <laughs> the woman that had got the job before leaned across the desk and said, Go! It's the worst job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and then the man came back in the room. <laughs> I don't remember the names anymore. The man came back in the room, and she was like, "Yeah, you really should come here." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Did you take I... it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no you, did take, you did take the hint then. <laughs> I think the the worst face to face one I ever had was something that I didn't even realise I'd done. Um. <laughs> Uh, you know, because you're naive. I mean, I, I was uh, I was doing this. <laughs> I was talking to these guys from this bank that will remain nameless, and uh, it was the year about a year and a half after the iWatch had come out, the first one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I'd actually gone to Texas and spoken at South by Southwest and bought myself just one off the counter, and they were uh -huh. freely available. But apparently, when they first came out, people had kind of like signed up to them a year beforehand to get them when they came out. So the guy asked me, you know, that that I that I watch is quite difficult to get hold of. You know, how long did you have to wait? And I said, I just went to the shop and bought it. And he could, should have seen his face. And I didn't realize, but obviously it had been his prize thing that he just, you know, um, you know, had gone around the whole of the business saying, look what I got and all this sort of stuff. But actually, I got a laptop and a new iWatch just in Austin and Texas when I was there. Yeah, I didn't but yeah, but, th but just, you should have just told them how much the travel cost to get it. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't tell them any of that. It's, it's, it's just, I didn't realise how, you know, it's, it's those little objects of desire kind of thing. So. That's that's, a good, that, if you ever rename the, if you ever rename the uh, podcast, Little Objects of Desire. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that might come across a bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a spin-off. Maybe it's a spin-off. <laughs> A right. spin-off of the spin-off. Okay. <laughs> spin -off of the spin -off. Hey, hey, there's no rule <clears throat> how many spin-offs you can have. I'm sure I'm sure someone has tried it. Right. I've just looked at the time. We we this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you very thank much. You. I'm sure we will see you again, Scott, very soon. But thank you very much for your time. Yeah, and uh, put your ideas in the strategy board. We need all the we need to harness all the best ideas of the community and then we need to energize people. We will oh. be there with two hats on, trust me. We will put all the links in as well. Thanks, Thank work. you, Scott. Thanks. Bye now. Bye.